Hi, and welcome to From the Research Chair. It's a podcast done by Focus Consulting's Michael Falk and myself, Jason Voss. Um, today is episode nine, a kind of fun one that Michael and I have been teasing each other about for some time, because you see, we have different points of view on the root cause of behavioral bias. And it's a subject near and dear to our hearts. It features in a lot of our work. Um, I thought we would start everything off with Michael. You, you have kind of a unique take on behavioral uh, bias, behavioral finance in general, including some unique biases. The floor is yours. Talk to us about those unique ones that you've identified. Well, <clears throat> before I go into the unique ones, because behavioral bias, let me count the ways. I mean, really? I mean, what is the number up to? I think we're north of 100. It's amazing we can actually walk and communicate with anybody or each other. No, no, let's, let's come back. Let's come back. So what behavior can we at least begin with understanding cause and effect? Because of course, these can invert, but let's, let's go with the basics. Cause and effect. Something happens and we have a behavioral response. So what that means is something actually precedes the behavioral response. That would be called the realm of neuroscience to start to understand that. We're gonna dip a toe there in my world, but then we're not gonna stay because it's a slippery slope. All right, so behavioral is a reaction. Hmm. Two and 20, my friends, two and 20. This is the old pricing of most hedge funds. It is also roughly, somebody is gonna debate this, don't, roughly the weight and the energy consumption of the average human brain. 2% of one's body mass, 20% consumption of our metabolic resources at rest. Let's just call the brain an energy hog. All right, now that what we've done that, what we can say is that our brain is really, really smart and our brain wants to economize. Think of it as a Prius, if you will, right? Our brain wants to make all of its activity less energy consuming. So over time, our brain builds shortcuts. In the academic world, we call those heuristics. All right, <clears throat> for everybody, maybe we'll call those rules of thumb of behavior. Our brain builds shortcuts. Welcome to the world of behavioral bias. Behavioral biases are shortcuts to enhance our decision-making in terms of energy consumption, not output or result or fit. So where do these come from? They're produced over time based upon our life experiences and the immediate or recent context that we are existing in. At the neuroscience level, think of our body as wanting to stay at homeostasis at all times. It rarely gets there, doesn't it? It wants, this almost sounds like a supply demand curve for economics and balance, almost never there. All right, so our hormonal levels, males, females, all of us, no matter how you define yourself, our hormonal levels essentially are pushing and pulling at all times trying to get to homeostasis. The easiest push or pull is always preferred. It's always working. <clears throat> Our brain needs to economize, needs to be efficient. So let me say the first thing that is a bit of an odd view in the world of behavioral finance. I think biases are a good thing. I think they're a good thing for us from a physiological and biological level. But when we bring them out into the actual native real world, maybe they don't work so well at all times. So as with most things in life, the first step is to admit, do you have a bias that is consistently tripping you up and helping you make poorer decisions? Once you can admit that, you can fix it. Dun, dun, dun. You actually can do things. 
we're going to save that solution or range of solutions to the end of this call because Jason and I, while we disagree on some of this content, we agree on that. Okay. The grand poobah of behavioral bias says we can't. Jason and I know we can. So how about a little optimism then? But is there a progenitor? I believe there is. Jason Hold that thought. There, no, no, I know. Jason believes there is as well. But we actually think that the father or mother bias, we think it is different from one another. So we're going to come back to that. So let me leave you with one final thought of one of the big ones, one of the important biases that I know Jason is going to name, overconfidence. Why do I not bring that up? People, the average bar or restaurant in the world closes within one year, two years, whatever that statistic is. Why on earth would anybody ever open up a bar or restaurant? Because they have overconfidence. So I'm going to say I'm a fan of overconfidence. What we need it to do is not harm us. So that gets into the solution. Jason, tell us about your behavioral bias, general points of view. Well, I, I also agree that behavioral finance is a biological phenomenon. And for those of you who read my, my personal blog regularly know that I spent the summer doing deep dives into each of what I believe are the important of the major behavioral biases. Uh, you couldn't go to the beach? I did go to the beach, uh, planning on maybe doing it today or tomorrow if, if time and work allows. Um, but the, I think that I, I did that series with the idea of concluding with a theory of behavioral finance. I published a document two years ago, which was a theory of behavioral finance, which largely echoes Michael's, which is that behavioral finance is a biological phenomenon. Totally agree. However, I, I have hesitated to publish because I also recognize, and there's something irritating me uh, in the back of my mind, which is that behavioral uh, bias also has psychological uh, phenomena or causes as well as sociological ones as well. And I think, I think, yeah, exactly. It's the intersection of these three things. And I wanted to be as thoughtful about the psychological and sociological phenomenon as I had been in my, my theory of behavioral finance 1.0. And part of what that, uh, part of my ignorance there is not in the psychological realm. I have quite a lot of uh, scientific backing on the psychological manifestations of bias and how they come about. A little bit more ignorant about the sociological. Um, I'm a little bit more of a lay person in terms of sociology. To be true, truth be told, I've always kind of denigrated that science as a pure jargon science where we take things that all of us recognize and then name them something special. And then we claim to have been the first to name something that everybody has known for a long time. But I digress. Um, I, 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 did, I think that the convergence of these three things is what results in behavioral bias. Um, just real quickly, uh, Michael didn't state, but I would like to turn the, the, the microphone back over to him in just a moment. He did not state his biases that he thinks are major and manifest. He has kind of a unique take and I, I hope that he is willing to share it with each of you. My own take is out of the over 130 that have been identified by researchers and their new ones announced frequently, I have lost track of them. I used to in my uh, days at CFA Institute go to behavioral finance conferences and almost all of the papers delivered were the identification of a new bias uh, a new diagnosis, if you will, without prescription. And that's where Michael and I really feel that behavioral finance is lacking. And it's time for, after this thing has been around now for 50 years, to start talking about theories, one, but then also two, how, how do we overcome these biases? Then it becomes useful to have studied them. Again, I digress. My major uh, biases uh, can be remembered by the simple mnemonic device, lock harm, or brain lock that harms performance. That's L-O-C-H-A-A-R-M. The L is for loss aversion. And loss aversion says that we feel the pain of loss about twice as much as we do the pleasure from gain. Um, but there's a nuance there that most of us are unaware of. Uh, Michael and I see it manifest on investment teams, especially value shops frequently, which is when there's a big decline, we have a tendency to double down on our bet. And that is actually contrary. We would go from risk avoiders to risk takers when things have declined massively. 
And said another way, if you are a value investor, that is an especially, uh, what's the right word? Uh, pernicious uh, manifestation of loss aversion to avoid. It's a good word, pernicious. <laughs> it's a claw. It's a pernicious claw. Um, next is overconfidence, which Michael already mentioned. I think overconfidence needs no explanation. The next is confirmation bias. Uh, said another way, we tend to look for information that confirms our own belief about the world uh, because we, it's really hard for us to adjust our mental models. Look at the current state of the Western world's politics as a vast manifestation of confirmation bias. H is hurting, probably needs no explanation to the investment pros on our podcast today. Uh, next is anchoring, which is the tendency of people to fixate on a piece of information, very frequently the first piece of information, but it's also possible to have anchoring effects when important people speak. So if an important person has said something, we tend to anchor on what the important person said much more so than considering things equally. Next is available. stuck with biases and we can't do anything about them? No, we can absolutely do something about it. We'll get there. We're Don't getting anchor there. on that. We're getting there. Exactly. Don't anchor on that. Um, next one is availability. And availability bias is that we tend to overemphasize uh, information or factoids simply because they're available. So we may place an emphasis in our analyses on the level of the Dow Jones simply because it's available or the S&P 500 because it's available. It may have no bearing on the issue that is under consideration, but because it's widely reported, it's there. Another manifestation of that is as we're recalling information, we invoke our mental models, our preferred mental models, which Michael mentioned and said another way, they are readily available because we're fluent about them. They're habituated in terms of how we think about the world and thus we recall them and thus we overemphasize those mental models. Value would be another one. If I'm a value investor, I, my, I constantly look at my screens and see what's sold off recently. Um, next is uh, representativeness bias. Again, pure jargon science, behavioral finance borders on a pure jargon science. Representativeness says we make judgments based on stereotypes frequently, duh. And last is mental accounting, which says that we tend to um, contextualize um, things that are actually very similar, if not exactly the same, but apply different decision rules to each of those different things. Most famously, we think of uh, in terms of portfolio management, we may have a gr growth portion of the portfolio. We may have an income generating portion of the portfolio. It may all be equities, mind you. And then we have a part that we just, it's kind of like the low volatile, low volatility part of our portfolio. It's all money. It's all fungible, but we have different decision rules based on these different categories. That's mental accounting. Um, so those are my major ones. Michael, I, I want to turn back over to you because you, you identify ones that I also think are biases, but you don't see widely researched. What are they? Well, you know, the same way our hormonal levels push and pull. So let me give you the two biases that push and pull each other constantly. Status quo bias and activity bias. These two biases act just like our hormonal levels. They are constantly tugging. Do something. No, don't do anything. Do something. No, don't do anything. Um, I'm also, is it fair to say I'm a fan of a certain bias, Jason? <laughs> no, I, I have an appreciation for one that I think is also pernicious. I just like that word. Uh, regret bias. And that is regret bias simply defined as the fear of commission over the fear of omission. Rather, it combines the activity and the status quo biases in a very specific way. If I do something and it doesn't work out well, shame on me. So maybe I do nothing. So those are a few ads. Jason, you named some real big dogs that unfortunately hunt quite a bit in the behavioral bias world. I would add and complement those. Conformity bias, which I think is a little bit of hurting, but in the decision-making realm, which Jason and I spend our time with investment teams and helping them with decision-making, conformity bias lives large. And it is how people actually make their decision down to how they vote yay or nay. And we have simple fixes for things like these for investment teams. Uh, so those are a few ads that I would like to add, uh, contribute to your lock harm, Jason. But at the end of the day, can we go to uh, the progenitor proposals? 
Yeah, ab absolutely. And I'll, because you've already got the floor, um, I would turn it over to you first. What, what is the progenitor? What is to you, you, you framed this as cause and effect. Presumably you're going to talk about the big cause, letter C cause, as opposed to little C cause. What, what's the little, what's the big C cause in your yeah, world? The big, the big cause is the future is unknown. The future being unknown brings forth all sorts of fears and worries and concerns. And when we think about all of those biases, if we knew the future, we knew what was gonna happen tomorrow, we had certainty, then overconfidence wouldn't be overconfidence, it would be good decision-making. Loss aversion, we wouldn't have to concern ourselves with. Regret bias, no. Activity bias, yes or no. Almost every bias that Jason and I named, if we had certainty about the future, would simply wash away. So my progenitor bias, because of that, is uncertainty aversion. Some people know this as ambiguity aversion. It goes by two different names. Again, the problem with the labeling, uh, essentially, because we have so much uncertainty about the unknown future, we have these decision rules to prevent us. These are biases are decision rules, right or wrong. They're decision rules. They exist to keep us from a state of concentrated confusion and discomfort because we have to do something and we don't know what the right thing to do is. The biases help us. So I think the progenitor is uncertainty or as again, some people know it as ambiguity aversion. Can I ask you several questions about that? Sure, I may not answer. <laughs> and by the way, even though Michael and I are debating this, our hope here is not to come up with the right answer. Um, I think Michael, you agree with me, you and I in fact have joked over about this before. The answer to almost every single one of life's questions is it depends. Yeah. So I think we, we, we would like- Framework, people, yeah. a framework. Exactly. We just wanna equip everybody with a, a thoughtful discussion. We would love to hear what your thoughts are on this too uh, in just several minutes. And uh, we're not trying to declare a winner here. I, we had debated, or I had debated putting a poll, who won? I don't think that's very useful. Um, the, the answer is, is it useful to you that we have had this discussion and that you have a takeaway that you can take back within your investment practice and, and get better at? So, so my question um, about uncertainty, I, as I'm thinking about that, and I don't disagree that uncertainty is an important issue, um, I'm, I'm thinking about that sociological effect, right? Um, you mean and, the, the, the area you don't like? Well, not, it's not that I don't like, I'm just, okay, I don't like it. I admit it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it because I guess I've always sort of been a fringe player, right? I've always, you know, tended to gravitate towards the edge of something rather than the middle of something. I have a book about it that I quite love, by the way. About sociology. But the, the, let's not digress there yet. I, I'm curious about what that book title is. Um, so my question about uh, is within that sociological realm. So if I follow your line of thinking, I'm making assumptions here. I just want to check that my assumptions jibe with your assumptions too, so that the audience I, I think can better understand. If we agree, and it sounded like you did, that there's a sociological dimension to behavioral bias, um, then if I had certainty, presumably I care about what the group thinks because I, have, I care about forming groups because I'm safer in groups if they're tigers at the watering hole, for example. And so that would be your argument for why their sociological effects is that we like to move in a herd or move in a pack because there's greater certainty if, if we have affiliation and allies. Is, would that be your, your theory there? It's a very fair assumption that has some cracks in it. There's no question, but let's be candid. Humans have risen to dominate this little blue dot because of this herding of groups. Collaboration helped our advancements. So we can't call herding uniquely negative. In some ways it has 
allowed us to get to where we are. Again, I can see a positive with most of the biases, which are not talked about in the media and research, which to me is quite disturbing. But with most things, it can go too far. So talk, talk to me, and I'm, I'm curious, I, I, I mean that genuinely, right? This is not, I'm not using questioning as a means of making debate points. I'm just genuinely curious to understand fully. And for the audience, Michael and I have talked about this before, but never at, at this level of depth. We're usually too busy getting on, getting on to, to have the conversation. Talk to me about anchoring bias, right? So, right, the, the classic example of anchoring is, that, that comes literally from the literature, and I love it, is in the early 1960s. Um, one of the first tests of it were that they got nuclear uh, physicists and nuclear proliferation experts to debate a subject. And they had, I, I don't remember what N was, but they divided N number of nuclear physicists and proliferation experts into smaller groups. And then they, they ostensibly were being interviewed for a discussion like ours right now, like a panel discussion. And the panel leader, the moderator, would throw out a number like, um, how soon until um, the Soviet Union get, you know, has 3,000 warheads? Is it seven years? And they just changed up randomly that initial number of seven. Um, and inevitably, the average amount of time spoken about anchored on seven, right? The debate, seven tended to be what everybody anchored on. If they changed it to three, it was three years. If it was nine years, nine years. And they even got ridiculous about it because they saw this phenomenon. They redid it with different people. And they were like 73 years in the future, right? And the answers universally were anchored toward, you know, really extreme numbers. What's the uncertainty version of that? I, I'm, I'm scratching my head trying to think how uncertainty explains anchoring. Well, the way you described it, Jason, it was availability bias included in that, right? So the availability of a number had then poisoned the rest of the process. Okay, it infected, if you will. Poisoned, I think, is better in this case. All right. <clears throat> so what the problem was, was the group they put together to try and solve the uncertainty. They put together a group and they framed the conversation in such a way that poisoned all of the work. If they actually reconstructed the decision process and said, let's just see where they go, they were unwilling to embrace the uncertainty. And so they gave a framing to work from. That's how I would talk about it. Hmm. I think that's a pretty good answer. I'll have to mold that over probably uh, post this call. I'm not quite sure I'm satisfied that that's a perfect explanation for how it came about. In other words, announce myself as a blind squirrel for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, you've got your cards on the table. It's only fair I put mine out there too, so you can begin to question me as well, and we can engage in, you know, back and forth in hypotheticals. Have fun. Yeah, I, I, I think that's our goal here, um, to chortle, giggle, and Always. not be pernicious, to not be pernicious. <laughs> um, so for me, the, the mother or father, the progenitor bias is a lack of self-awareness. And to me, that explains each of the major behavioral biases. Michael acknowledged, for example, that these biases are a good thing. They're developed because they're a good thing, because they're efficient or they help or they help connect us to a group, which increases survivability, if you will. Um, from a psychological perspective, um, we use them because they make us feel good. Because guess what? They solve problems um, that, that we frequently encounter, which is why, for example, with availability bias, the reason we have some mental models that are preferred and at the ready and at a hair's trigger can be triggered uh, and invoked is because they're useful. Right. So more bars and restaurants. Yes. More bars and restaurants. Uh, so my argument is what we lack is discernment about when to use the mental models, the, these biases and when they are appropriate. Um, and I will, offer up uh, an interesting, I think, anecdote here. Uh, for those of you who know me pretty well, I studied martial arts for a couple of years at a pretty high level. It was essentially like a full-time job for me. And one of the things that we spent a lot of time doing was refining the difference between instinct and 
thinking about something. And athletes go through the same problem all the time. You talk about being in the zone, but sometimes being in the zone can lead you astray if invoked uh, in a moment is the incorrect instinctual mental model, right? If you're purely in the zone, I would argue everything's going great, but it's really hard for athletes to do, to get in the flow state, if you will, routinely. So inevitably they're factoring in some sort of analytical process, something their coach said to them, in football here in the US, you know, they've reviewed film and they, that may trigger as they go up to the line of scrimmage in American football and they forget to play, right? The point is, is that in martial arts, you can't be purely instinctual. If you were purely instinctual and somebody came at you with real force and energy, which you play with in the dojo, your real instinct is to kill the other person. Um, so there has to be some sort of self-awareness and trigger put in there, but not too much. And to me, that's what we're trying to do as investment professionals is be instinctual about our use of mental models, gain fluency. So lots of techniques, if you will. Charlie Munger says he has well over 100 mental models. I've mapped my own. I can only get to about 80 or so uh, in terms of mapping my mental models. And I'd like to think I'm aware of the context in which they're appropriate and that there's fluency on my part, meaning not a lot of having to think about the vocabulary, how to construct a sentence, Intellectually, I think I have fluency in when to use these. And so it comes off instinctually. It comes off as, wow, that guy's a smart guy. You know, he's a rapid thinker. When in fact, behind the scenes, there's been a lot of work to gain self-awareness about this and then to implement fluency. So for me, the, the major progenitor uh, bias is a lack of self-awareness. And I think it explains all, all the other biases. Michael, your response. I think you cheated. <laughs> How did I Let cheat? Me explain. Let me explain. You, you detest or dislike, I don't to test, detest is a bit strong, sociology. You just invoked sociology into your progenitor, if I understood it correctly, right? Self-awareness. So if you have self-awareness, for example, I'm going to extend. I'm not going to question. I'm going to extend my prerogative. Uh, if you have social, if you have self-awareness, you can recognize, I really don't know anything about the future. But I'm then going to use these models to help me manage my decision making to hopefully be more effective, more efficient, right? Whatever terms you want to use better, okay, into the unknown. Okay, fine. But those mental models, Jason, are they not, in this case, one form of solution to overcome bias? They can be, sure. Uh, to the degree that the moments you anticipate have probability that they, they it's a repetition of something you know and understand and can cope with, right? And so, for example, bringing it back down into an investment context, I think one of the reasons why fundamental analysis works uh, and there's so much energy spent trying to identify a business's moats said another way we've got michael's uncertainty bias here but we're also and we're trying to reduce the unlikelihood of our thesis not repeating the problem is is that's frequently correctly priced um, so we're using a mental model which may be valuation here my point about self-awareness is valuation and sticking to your guns in a biased fashion uh, and not recognizing state changes and only blindly using the mental model in the face of uncertainty um, not, is not helpful is not helpful so oh, the classic example right now is value managers by and large stink and they really? stink because they're waiting for a an inevitable reversion to the mean okay. Don't throw them all under the bus. They don't all stink. <laughs> I'm a value investor. They have allocated a mental model to their work for, let's say, the last 12 years. All right. That is not coinciding with reality. Indeed. And what they fail to recognize That's is how the world is different that. now. I say they stink. Well, they may be great at value investing, but they're not delivering returns for their shareholders and their that's customers. Yeah, yeah. That I can't, that's, that's a problem. Yeah, and not only that, but there's an assumption there, perhaps a fatal flaw, which is this time is just like all the other times without having any discussion about how things are different. So earlier this summer, I had authored a post 
uh, because I did a piece about the equity risk premium and its history going back to 1880. And I, there was an extended period of time from uh, the late 80s that, that lasted for about 30 years where the equity risk premium was negative. Said another way, uh, there was quote unquote, less volatility or less risk in buying equities than in buying US treasuries, uh, 10 year US treasuries. And my question was why? And I put forth a number of reasons why, which much to my surprise, that turned out to be a pretty popular uh, article on my part. But really what it was is how things are different now than they were 30 years ago. Um, said another way, said another way, trying to bring some self-awareness to how things were different. Um, Michael. what I'd like to do. You know, I'm, I'm a fan of little pithy formulas, right? Uh, Dalio's pain plus reflection equals progress, as an example. I happen to like that. You know, then he's got like 120 others as well. All right. <laughs> how about intentions? do not always equal impact. There's another one that's, that's a focus consulting ism. All right, Jason, what I wanna do with your self-awareness and my uncertainty aversion is I wanna create a pithy formula. So the question is, can I, can I elicit your assistance in this? Because I'm coming up with more of a sentence, I don't wanna do that, than a pithy formula. And so let me give one out, I'll toss it out as fodder, all right? Self-awareness plus uncertainty aversion can equal unbiased success or debiased success. To put, put, put some real world examples in there. That, that's a distillation. I said it was supposed to be pithy. <laughs> Well, your, your pithy is, I think, it, maybe I'm speaking only for myself. I, I almost grok it. I almost understand it. Uh, tell me more. Well, I happen to quite like your bringing sociology into the equation because I think it's true and it's real, right? So I like self-awareness in there. <clears throat> but self-awareness in and of itself doesn't solve the uncertainty aversion because it depends on if the self-awareness can break the cycle of essentially what our brain is attempting to do, right? Or can we create a new cycle? So what my thinking here, and again, it may be flawed because we've never discussed this before. Folks who are listening, this is the first time that we've gone this deep on the topic. If we have self-awareness and we recognize that we're, we have this progenitor uncertainty aversion bias, then the combination of the two working together, we can de-bias and have more success. Yeah, I think, thank you for, for saying but that. Maybe I think I need to reorder the formula. No, well, let me, let me respond to that. One of the reasons why, because you've shared with me before uncertainty you believe is the progenitor. I've shared with you before a lack of self-awareness is mine. Yeah, so this is transparency. We did know this about each other. We just never had this dialogue. Yeah, we've never discussed this in depth. And Michael and I frequently discuss lots of things in depth and for we can three, four hours can disappear without us really sort of, Some of my having favorite a check. Conversations, Jason. And likewise. And for, for, for in my almost 28 year career, um, so here's my issue with uncertainty. I, I don't, and it's interesting how you reframed it here as uncertainty aversion bias. I do agree that people have aversion to uncertainty, but uncertainty itself to me is not a behavior, right? So it can't be a mother or father. It's almost like something else. Whereas I think lack of self-awareness is a behavior. There's a choice there. We don't get to choose whether the world is uncertain or not. That's just something that's a given. Um, and so I'm having a hard time understanding it in the formula because I guess I don't, for me, I don't see it as a bias, but you reframed it as uncertainty aversion bias. Maybe I need to hear a little bit more about that. Well, fair, fair criticism, Jason. Uh, it's not a bias. It is the trigger for all of the biases. That's why I think it's a progenitor. So I guess the question is, does the progenitor in, in our storyline here that we're trying to build, does it have to be a bias in and of itself? 
Yeah, I'm I, saying no, I don't think it does, but you can freely disagree to that. Yeah, and I, I don't know that I disagree. I'm trying to understand. Whereas I think of like one of the big le leaps forward for me as a portfolio manager was uh, practicing, uh, for, for those of you on the call who don't know, I'm a life, lifetime, uh, lifelong meditator uh, and Buddhist, and I'm, I'm not a Buddhist, uh, but Buddhists teach non-attachment, right? So to accept the world as it is, not how you would prefer it to be. Which is uh, a good thing. Yeah, which is a good thing. And once I accepted that as a PM, that I couldn't control the outcomes. I could control process, right? I could, the thing I was certain about was my process and whether it was good and whether or not it was applied accurately. Did I have self-awareness about correct application models and when? Once I knew that that was where I should put my energy and let go of uncertainty, I could have conversations legitimately where in my, my career as a Lipper number one manager a couple of times where people would congratulate me for that and I would accept no responsibility for that. I would accept responsibility for the process and the philosophy and the execution, but the outcome I had no control over. Said another way, anecdotally, um, the same philosophy process and execution lent to me or rendered unto me an interview with the Wall Street Journal in 1999 or 2000 about what an idiot I was as a PM because I didn't understand technology and the portfolio. I was meant to justify why in, I think, year 2000, I was only up 39% versus the market, which was up way much, much higher that year. And then two years later, they checked back in with me and they asked what changed. Nothing had changed. It was the same philosophy, process, and execution. What had changed were the results. Um, so anyway, um, my point is self-awareness about that and a lack of attachment about uncertainty. To me, that's exactly why we cultivate self-awareness is to make that philosophy, process, execution better. And among those realizations is I can't control those outcomes. Stop sweating it. You can't control it. Anyway, I'll pause. I think I'm going to reorder the formula. Do it. Do it. Yeah, because what I'm hearing, Jason, in, in that explanation is your, self, your level of self-awareness. And I'm going to describe that as acceptance. All right. So your level of acceptance means that what you do with uncertainty aversion is you go, hmm. So you de-bias because of your acceptance, right? So you don't have the pushes and the pulls because of the acceptance. So maybe self-awareness equals No, I need to, I need, um, I, while you're, while you're grasping is proving to be problematic to me, I may have to not try right now. I bet the, the nature of creating on the fly, right. Is that something will occur to you at a different time. When you were speaking your formula, I was like, I almost like the formulation and I'm a big fan of getting the variables correct. And I think we've identified two of the key variables here. No doubt. I believe that uncertainty absolutely plays into most of these biases. I'm going to come back. Go, go ahead. No, okay. Well, I want to come back. So I changed. So self-awareness equals uncertainty aversion minus bias. Say it again. Self-awareness equals uncertainty aversion minus bias. Say it again. I'm going to, we're going to reorder the equation. Self-awareness equals... If I say it three times, you know it's going to be true. Uh, uncertain, <laughs> uncertainty aversion minus bias. So said another way. Self-awareness plus bias equals uncertainty aversion. So if I self-awareness plus bias equals uncertainty aversion. So ergo, if my self-awareness is greater than my bias, then uncertainty aversion would be negative. Well, let's just say it would be minimized and it can go lower and lower and lower, right? Based upon levels, if we wanna talk about uh, amounts. I like that. Um, I'm not sure I'm gonna grab the, the granite and the chisel, 
Uh, but let's talk about this. Um, let, I, I wanted you to finish your point because I'm a big believer uh, in creative process and you had the creative tiger by the tail there and I sure as heck was going to be responsible for barging in on the grasp uh, of the tail. Um, the point I was making is I'm a big believer when constructing formula. And by the way, I, I think that that's one of the things I'm pretty good at. I'm actually terrible at arithmetic, but I'm really good at describing real world phenomena and their relationships to one another, which is all that mathematics really is. And especially if you can quantify the elements. So I'm a big believer of identifying the elements and getting them ring fenced in some sort of formulation, but then getting the signs correct. And math has given us a lot of cool operators which actually have real world consequences, which was, you heard it in my language, think about greater than, less than, plus, minus, greater than zero, less than zero. And I'm wondering, do we have the signs correct? And in your first uh, iteration of this, I was thinking to myself, if self-awareness is greater than, I, here's how I was thinking, self-awareness is greater than the moment I'm confronted with, then bias is negative. And I'm trying to think if that works based on our formula here. Self-awareness, if I, I rearrange- Uncertainty aversion decreases. Right. Of bias is negative. I'm trying to rearrange it and get self-awareness join. I'm trying to take uncertainty aversion over onto the side of self-awareness. Here's my challenge with self-awareness, yep. Jason. You've, you've taken it to a very beneficial level where when you can take self-awareness to acceptance, that's not step one. That's a higher level, right? That is where things change, but not root self-awareness. Yeah. Well, I, I, have a tattoo, I have a tattoo on my left arm, right? Indeed, you Serenity do. to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That tattoo is my left forearm. Yeah. So I think you're at a higher level with well, self-awareness. That may be, but I'm not assuming here 100% self-awareness. In fact, the reason I like self-awareness as the progenitor of the biases is it suggests a natural prescription, which I know you and I desire, which yeah. is get more self-aware. And in fact, uh, just yesterday, um, there was a little bit of a back and forth in a Twitter feed, very minor, and by no means at all aggressive or uh, vitriolic. It was so just it a discussion. At Twitter, yeah, I don't even know if it rose to the level of spat. But somebody that we, Michael and I both have a lot of respect for, was at a conference where from the stage somebody called out something about gender bias and saying, we silly, and the response from our mutual acquaintance was, silly humans, there's always going to be gender bias, why do we even try? And the answer is, well, because there's neuroscientific proof that you can in fact overcome bias, including sexism, ageism, racism, and lo and behold, more mundane things like loss aversion, or I get offended because somebody behaved sociologically poorly, which is called the ultimatum game. Um, and guess what the trick is? Um, the root of how scientists, neuroscientists have demonstrated that you can overcome bias is through meditation. And these are meditation naive folks. They're not, to your point, Michael, shaven headed cave dweller meditation athletes. This is not a cave, by the way. <laughs> it's definitely not rocky. These are not shaven-headed cave dweller meditation athletes. These are people who have eight weeks or less uh, meditation experience. And what the neuroscientists have noticed is that when confronted with phenomena, real world phenomena, that the meditators respond in exactly the same way as predicted by the standard status quo behavioral finance community. That is with uncertainty aversion, right? They tend to invoke their mental models in my language unconsciously, but meditators do something interesting. They're able to stop the firing of system one instinctual responses and they shift to prefrontal cortex and they then begin to evaluate the situation at hand. There's a delay, which some of the tests about bias do in fact measure the delay, but people still come to the right answer. Said another way, it's possible to retrain the mind which comes as no surprise to parents who see the evolution of their children from three-year-olds misbehaving in a restaurant to sitting calmly and having a discussion on a podcast with, a, with a, somebody where there's a intellectual stakes potentially uh, happening. Um, so anyway, the, the point is, is that 
I don't know that I agree that you have to have 100% self-awareness. Self-awareness though suggests a prescription, get more self-aware. Yeah, and uncertainty aversion promotes a prescription as well. Say it, state it, don't tease us. You have no control of most of everything around you at all times. And once you let go of your, your demand for control, things get better. Things Should we pause better. here, you and me? I, I want to reiterate our formula just for the record, because I think it's a, it's a hypothesis to be confirmed or denied by deeper thinking. And I love, I love mental experiments. Um, we've got self-awareness equals uncertainty aversion minus bias. Um, that's just for the record. Uh, I did write it down. I would like to hear, Michael, I bet you would. We've got about 10 minutes left in our scheduled hour. How, how this conversation has landed with anybody in the audience and do they have contributions, refutations, compliments, criticisms? I'd love to hear that. Yeah. Was this valuable? Did you enjoy it? Did you, have you got pinged a couple of ideas maybe to play with yourself? Because we're talking about frameworks, not answers. I don't think we put them to sleep, Jason. <laughs> Hello. Well, go, go ahead. Who is that? Hello. So uh, thank you very Hi, much. Uh, so I'm Florence Russo. Hi, Florence. Hello. Thank you for having uh, this conversation and sharing it with us. Um, I'm just a little bit confused because I feel that we're talking about two different things. So let me explain myself. Sure, when please. When you talk about self-awareness, uh, you talk about a behavior, an attitude. Um, and when you talk about uncertainty aversion, you talk about a trigger, like what triggers the mind to look for a solution when faced um, with a certain situation. So how do you, like for me, self-awareness does not um, exclude uncertainty. And it's more a way to respond to uncertainty, just like a doctor with his knowledge of science and biology will be able to, um, I don't know, operate my heart. Whereas myself in the street, I would just try to do whatever comes to my mind instinctively. So how can we reconcile um, self-awareness with uncertainty? Or even maybe there are other attitudes, other behaviors that can help us manage uncertainty. For example, I'm thinking about creativity. Creativity can also be a, another way to, to act uh, in front of a certainty that would help us with biases. I love that. Um, Florence, thank you very much for your comments and your yeah, questioning. of a... to hear from you in that way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, Michael, I'm going to respond first and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, I think your points are valid. Um, I, I think there's a sign mismatch, if I will, here, or a, um, they say, for example, uh, or a units mismatch, since we tried to formulate this as a, an equation. That's on me. Yeah, well, yeah, but we could work with that potentially. I would say that that's something to use to refine potentially the hypothesis. I agree. Florence, with what you said, I, I maybe selfishly interpreted what you said to be a little bit more in my camp on things, but it doesn't really matter. But the what, thing I want to respond to, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. What I wanted to say is in terms of the self-awareness bit, it is possible. And I don't know. And by the way, medit there's a frequent confusion is the difference between meditation as a practice and meditative states of consciousness. Um, all of us are able to achieve meditative states of consciousness, and we do so uh, every day. And science has demonstrated that, except in people who are comatose, uh, that that's occurring. So the question becomes, what can you glean there? What can you witness there? And that meditative state of consciousness, by definition, is called metacognition, which is awareness of awareness itself. Said another way, if it's really refined and you can sustain it, you can actually witness the birth of a thought within your mind, and you can even track the mental traces and origins, sometimes in long-term meditators, and I've had this experience myself, 
to the origin of a habit or a behavior, and you can, in fact, reprogram your mind. So, for example, just the other day, uh, or actually it was this morning, uh, my wife and I went to go get donuts, and the, uh, there was a give a penny, take a penny thing next to the register, and I took three pennies out. Uh, I think my total was $2.68, and I didn't want a bunch of pennies back. So I gave three pennies, which meant that my change should have been 35 cents, U.S. dollars. And the cashier had a hard time doing the math because she's used to tapping the, the thing out on the register. Said another way, there was uncertainty entered into her realm and she didn't know how to respond. She didn't have the correct mental model. But, and this is the mental trace, I said to her, no big deal. I, just, I gave you three cents, just subtract it from the total, give it back to me and that were added to the total that you were gonna give back to me, that's how you do the math. And I was very kind to her. Why? Because when I worked at Burger King, when I was 15 years old and I was working the register, somebody was very unkind to me in that moment and tortured me for not understanding how to solve that problem. And I made a promise to myself that I would never treat anybody that way. Oh my God, it, 30, fast forward 35 years into the future, I was able to exercise that. Why? Because there was self-awareness and a memory. I know exactly where that promise to myself traced back to. And that's the sort of self-awareness that I'm talking about. And I think becomes a very valuable weapon against uncertainty. Not perfect, but a, a strong one. Florence, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so describing uncertainty aversion as a trigger, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, whether or not we can then say self-awareness is the answer, complete, incomplete, different topic. Uh, from the perspective of, we just want to try and understand if there's a trigger here. So I think we are aligned in that it is a trigger and then self-awareness is the potential prescription solution to assist with that, to prevent the trigger from devolving into bad decision-making. And Michael, what I like about that, my formulation, and I now remember I misspoke it earlier, my formulation of the terms that we identified, which were self-awareness, uncertainty, aversion, and bias in general, I like if-then statements. I would say if self-awareness greater than bias equals lower uncertainty aversion. And that was how I, I thought of it initially. And I've, anyway, that's one of my ways of describing the world with math is get the things that are interrelated and then get the signs right and you start to have insight. And I, to me, that one works better. Before we sign off, any thought to what Jason and I were just talking about as a result of your, your good thinking? Please. That was to Florence, I believe. Oh, sorry. I, th I thought maybe somebody else in the audience, but um, no, I, 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 I totally agree um, with both of you. And for me, both of your s thoughts are not incompatible, are not mutually exclusive. I just have a little bit of a problem with um, the equation. Can you really have an equality between, let's say, uh, pears and apples? That's where I'm trying to figure out how can we reconcile both ideas, um, which can both be observed, but then again, in different ways or, um, how, how can I say this? It's, it's not easy, it's really not easy. And I'm also trying to figure out at the same time as you, how can we formulate it in, a, in an equation to express bias? Because if I understood correctly, this is a little bit the, the topic of the conversation. What, equals bias so in other words how why do we have biases now we know but what's the root cause and why what makes them let's say bigger or smaller and that's where the equation comes in in terms of levels i'm going to simply take this as an assignment <laughs> I, I like it i like it as an assignment and, and i Florence, appreciate that yeah Thank you something for us to work on but because we're at the top of the hour jason tell them what we're going to talk about on episode 10. well before we do that before we do that i think we should summarize our conversation um i don't think either michael uh nor nor myself neither michael nor me sought to create an equation necessarily i think what we wanted to do is to talk about bias behavioral bias which is a persistently 
uh, subtractive effort if done, if the biases are large in the investment process, the results tend to be lower. I think we agree with that. That's the first thing. And the two, we wanted to talk about it because I think Michael and I believe that there's a lot of noise in the behavioral finance space. One example of that noise is there are 130 something biases that have been identified. Good luck you know, folding that into your investment process. And I think both of us have felt the compelling need to A, come up with diag not just diagnoses, but prescriptions. One thing that's essential and important is if you can identify uh, or reduce the biases down to a single bias or just a few biases, then the prescription becomes much easier to solve for. And so that's why for me, self-awareness, and I'm gonna summarize mine, I'll let Michael summarize here. Self-awareness I like as the cause of these biases because it suggests a natural direction, become more self-aware. And there are lots of techniques that you can employ to become more self-aware. Michael. Our body is constantly trying to achieve homeostasis. The uncertain future throws that out of whack. We have biases that are naturally produced and created over our life that help to push and pull us towards homeostasis. So put another way, biases are to try and stabilize our biology. They have nothing to do with making decisions. And that's why they are harmful when it comes to decision making if we don't recognize and actually build in controls. Yeah, and to final, final thought, and I don't mean to have the last word. I, I, I hate that about myself. That is a habit I'm trying to rectify. Um, so stop. I, well, I think it, it, I think it is important here I, I think we, this is a work in progress. This is, this is literally frontiers of behavioral finance because behavioral finance is still busily recording new biases. And I think Michael and I are interested in prescription. I think it's well past time that we start to have conversations with how do you overcome the biases? Um, yeah. So maybe we pick up this conversation another time. Um, I, I'm certainly interested in it, passionate about it. Yeah. Um, so our next episode, episode 10, will be two weeks from today. We do these every other week, always on a Thursday, always at noon Eastern here in the U.S. Um, and our subject, um, in anticipation of the new year, we're going to do a uh, discussion of the state of the industry. And by the industry, we're talking about the investment management industry and thinking about strategy. Um, and Michael and I have lots of insights on how to do strategy better and we think they're natural complements. Let's think about 2021, what's coming, and we'll use that as a springboard to discuss our views on strategy. We'll see you in two weeks. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye, all. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Welcome. Bye.